Welcome to a short lecture on Presidents John F. Kennedy and Lyndon Blaine Johnson, which covers roughly the period from 1960 to 1968. There'll be sort of a decisive change in American politics after 1968. 1960 to 1968 is really sort of the, the height of liberal American politics. After this point, we go into a much more balanced and uh, lengthy conservative reaction that we'll get into afterwards. But this is sort of the, the great society, which we'll talk about, about Johnson, is sort of the high watermark of what you would call traditional old liberal American politics. Um, I'm going to start with Kennedy. Um, Kennedy is oftentimes listed as one of the most influential United States presidents, mostly due to his popularity and a lot of things that are sort of just unique to him. He was the 31st president. He was the youngest president so far in American history. He was a Democrat. And he was sort of catapulted to the stage um, because he's very charismatic. Um, the, the debates between him and Richard Nixon in the election of 1960 were the first ever televised debates. And the image difference between a young John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon couldn't have been more different if you tried to make them that way. Kennedy won the election of 1960. Uh, the Electoral College made it look like it was a lot further of a gulf than it actually was. Kennedy won 303 electoral votes to Nixon's 219. So he won by almost 100 electoral votes. But many of those states, he won by very slim margins. In fact, JFK, as he's often referred to, won the popular vote by only 0.17%. So well less than 1% of the popular vote. He won the popular vote by a little over 100,000 votes. Very, very slim margin. So we're going to take a look at two different aspects of his presidency now. Um, the first is going to be the domestic side. The domestic side of John F. Kennedy gets much less attention than the foreign affairs side. And the reason for a lot of that is because many of Kennedy's achievements, his domestic achievements, are actually things that wind up be being accomplished by his successor, um, LBJ. Kennedy took office in the fourth major recession since World War II. Business bankruptcies were extremely high. In fact, um, incomes had gone down and had decreased 25% since 1951. And it, it's not great depression level, but 5.5 million Americans were out of work. To try to stimulate the economy, Kennedy used legislation to lower taxes, increase the minimum wage, protect the unemployed, and make efforts to energize business and especially housing sectors. Kennedy's political strategy when it comes to civil rights legislation, however, was to try to delay sending an, a big civil rights bill to Congress, <coughs> excuse me, until his second term when he could afford to split his party and pick up the backing of moderate Republicans to pass the measure. He felt that if he pursued such legislation, that in his first term, the rest of his program would. However, African Americans were extremely frustrated by the political maneuvering African Americans support for Kennedy in the South and in many of the cities in the North was crucial in his winning the election. And they insisted on some immediate protection to their rights. Things do change a little bit. On June 11th, 1963, Kennedy has this sort of famous face down with the governor of Alabama, who's a name, man by the name of George Wallace. Uh, George Wallace, uh, perhaps even then, certainly now today we would say, he was a racist. Um, he was a Southern Democrat whose policy was to be an ardent segregationist. And they get into it over the state's flagship university, um, the University of Alabama, and whether or not the University of Alabama is going to be integrated. Now, you'll remember from previous lectures, Brown versus the Board of Education required the integ integration of educational institutions in 1954. So this is 1963, this is nine years later, and we still have a lot of efforts by different individuals across parts of the former Confederacy who are attempting to resist those efforts. 
at integration. Furthermore, there's a, a big murder that takes place around this time. The Mississippi NAACP director, Medgar Evans, um, was murdered um, in Mississippi. And that murder and sort of the high profile level of it forced Kennedy's hand. So in fact, the next morning after Medgar Evans was murdered, Kennedy submitted a civil rights bill to Congress, which will not become law until after his death. But in a famous televised speech announcing his decision, he observed that the grandchildren of former slaves freed by Lincoln, quote, are not yet freed from the bonds of injustice. The last thing that I wanted to talk about, which I suppose could go in either category, either foreign affairs or in domestic policy, I've chosen to put it here in domestic policy, is the moon landing. The moon landing will not happen until well after Kennedy's assassination. However, Kennedy gives a series of inspirational speeches encouraging Americans to look at the space race and to look at the potential moon landing as the last frontier for America and a way for America to really throw its weight around against the Soviet Union. Speaking of the Soviet Union, I talked about all of these things um, in the lecture about the Cold War, so I'm not going to go over them again in excruciating detail, but just understand that during Kennedy's administration, this is when the Cold War is really starting to heat up again after a period of, I'm not going to say when it was dormant, but when it was certainly less of a factor during the years of Eisenhower's presidency. The Cold War is raging at this point. Uh, a lot of the focus is on Cuba, the newly communist Cuba, the failed Bay of Pigs invasions by exiled Cubans living in Florida, backed by the CIA and the United States military, then precipitates the Cuban Missile Crisis, in which Kennedy and the Soviet Premier Nikolai Khrushchev have a showdown over whether or not missiles, Soviet atomic missiles, will be stationed on Cuba, ultimately. As you may remember from the last lecture, in exchange for removing missiles from Turkey, American missiles from Turkey, the Soviets agree to remove missiles from Cuba. This is also during the time period when the Vietnam War is really starting to pick up pace. But again, I'll talk about that in much greater detail in another lecture. But as I'm sure you know, President Kennedy does not serve the end of his term because on November the 22nd, 1963, while driving in an open motorcade in Dallas, Texas, President Kennedy is shot twice and dies shortly thereafter. His vice president, Lyndon Blaine Johnson, takes over for him. This is the fourth time now in American history that a president has been succeeded by his vice president as the result of an assassination. President Johnson is from Texas. And widely, President Johnson is known for his domestic accomplishments, although when I talk about the Vietnam War in a separate lecture, you'll see he has a much, much less rosy picture when it comes to that conflict. Uh, the, the big ambition and the thing that you have to understand about um, Johnson is this series of domestic reforms that he largely referred to as the Great Society. So we had the New Deal under FDR, and now under President Johnson, we have this series of programs to try to combat the growing wealth inequality in the United States that's called the Great Society. Um, these are programs with the main goal of ending poverty, reducing crime, abolishing inequality, and, and also improving the environment. In May of 1964, President Johnson laid out his agenda for a quote unquote great society during a speech at the University of Michigan. With his eye on reelection that same year, Johnson set in motion his great society, which is actually the largest social reform plan in modern American history. In March of 1964, Johnson introduced the Office of Economic Opportunity and the Economic Opportunity Act during a special message to Congress. His hope was to help underprivileged people break out of the poverty cycle by helping them develop job skills and education so that they could find work. Crucially, to a large extent, these weren't handouts. You know, Johnson's theory was to try to support 
support education institutions and a special, especially technical schools to try to encourage people to help themselves out of poverty. To do this principally, he created a job corps for 100,000 disadvantaged men. Half would work on conservation projects, while the other half would receive education and skills training in specialized and newly created job training centers. In addition, Johnson tasked state and local governments with creating work training programs for up to 200,000 men and women. A national work study program was also established to offer 100,000 Americans the chance to go to college who would not otherwise have been able to afford it. This is generally referred to as his war on poverty. After Johnson became president, the Democrats took control of Congress in 1964, and they passed quickly two um, social reform programs that are absolutely still with us today and are considered to be very crucial programs. I'm talking about Medicare and Medicaid, which became law in 1964. Medicare covered hospital and physician costs for the elderly who qualified. Medicaid covered health care costs for people getting cash assistance from the government. They're both essentially safety net programs. So if you think about Social Security as the ultimate safety net program that is designed to try to provide support for people in the event that they become disabled or upon their retirement from the workforce, Medicaid and Medicare do the same thing except when it comes to health care. He was also really interested in education and founded the Head Start program, which is also still with us. The Head Start program started as an eight-week summer camp run by the Office of Economic Opportunity for 500,000 children across the United States, ages three to five. It's a lot more than that nowadays. The Head Start program runs things like um, free pre-K programs in a lot of places in the United States today. It's a lot of the reason why students and young very small um, young children are able to go to school before kindergarten, who would not otherwise have been able to afford it. Since the program's inception, it served over 32 million vulnerable children in America. Education reform was also a key part of the Great Society. And the last and most, one of the most important thing is that um, President Johnson passes what's called the Housing and Urban Development Act of 1965. So. After the Great Depression ends and, and during the 1950s, what you see is a lot of more affluent people leaving the large cities in the United States of America and moving to the suburbs. This movement takes place over a long period of time. We're talking about hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people who are relocating from the city to the suburbs. What that does is oftentimes it leads to downtown areas becoming derelict um, and or underused and utilized. They're not the economic driving engines that we think of today for downtown um, places in the United States. The Housing and Urban Development Act of 1965 sought to try to help that problem by providing money and resources to cities to try to rebuild urban areas that have been severely depopulated in the 1950s. And these programs are still with us today. I talked about this a lot in the lecture on the civil rights movement. So again, I just want to end today by mentioning that the civil rights legislation that was proposed by Kennedy was not passed by Kennedy because of his assassination. Those bills were signed into law in 1964 and then in 1965 by President Johnson, who is oftentimes credited with shepherding those bills through Congress, but it was not without um, some severe repercussions. As I discussed in the civil rights lecture, there was a lot of opposition to these bills across the South. If you take a look at the electoral map before 1964 and 1965 and the electoral map after 1964 and 1965, you will notice an immediate and decisive change. Southern Democrats were furious over President Johnson's support of these two acts. And almost overnight, the South goes from being solidly Democratic to being solidly Republican. This is the moment that that change goes into place. 
one of the casualties of the civil rights movement, certainly not the only. And then a further lecture, I will then talk about the Democratic National Convention of 1968, LBJ's decision not to run again for another term, which he could have, and how that ends up pushing the Democratic Party into chaos.